He's an, he's an amazing guy. He is uh, both a clinician uh, and an inventor. He is an entrepreneur and a visionary. He uh, has an undergraduate degree from Brown University, got his medical degree from Stanford, board certified in internal medicine and pediatrics. He had a Harvard residency as Mass General, Boston Children's, fellowships in hematology, oncology, bone marrow transplantation at Stanford. And right now, uh, among other things, he's the inventor of the marrow miner, which is an FDA approved technology that uh, goes in and gets in a minimally invasive way bone marrow, which can be so life-saving for so many. Five TED Talks and TED Med Talks. And if you want to learn about what is next in medicine and healthcare, take a listen to Dr. Daniel Kraft. Dan? Thank you. All right. Good morning. Thanks. Uh, it's, it's great to be here um, and have a chance not to just imagine, to, but to sort of think about reimagining uh, health and medicine across the healthcare paradigm. So I'm gonna, I've got 25 minutes to cover a whole amount of uh, really interesting elements um, and want to engage you to think about how you can play a role in thinking about the future of, of healthcare. So you just heard from Regina about a lot of these amazing technologies, many of which were developed at DARPA that have really uh, reshaped our lives in many ways, moving uh, in very fast and sometimes d disruptive elements. And, uh, you know, but a lot of those technologies are not always really translated to changes in healthcare. Healthcare is often a little bit stuck uh, between the third and the, the fourth industrial age. You know, we've reinvented how we do our banking and our movies, but, you know, we're still using, you know, fax machines in healthcare. Um, I was talking to a couple of the participants here who actually run hospital systems. You know, what's the future of the hospitals? It's still the four walls. Are we blending with more virtual care or telehealth? So, you know, as we look to the future of medicine, it's a bit helpful to have a, li a little bit of a look back to the future. What's also scary is we're past the date they went to in that movie. That was like 2016 was the future. I've had my own back to the future moments. I, as mentioned, I trained at Mass General Hospital. I was back there for the 200th anniversary of MGH with the guys and girls I was in the trenches with 20 years ago as a resident. And, uh, you know, there's some very historical, historic places at Mass General where they did the first general anesthesia back in 1846. You can visit the Ether Dome, it's pretty much frozen in time. But I was a little bit shocked and dismayed to go visit the ward where I was an intern 20 years ago, and in 20 years, it was also kind of frozen in time. Same alarms were beeping, some of the same nurses, maybe some of the same patients. Uh, the, the only difference was the young doctor was, pre it was you know, pushing around a, a, a computer to type notes. We used to handwrite them. And we're still using, again, fax machines to communicate a lot of our information across healthcare systems. And so, how do we get out of our mode of, you know, number two pencils and filling out forms? How do we get out of our old mindsets of going to the waiting room and waiting on average of 67 minutes for a, a, a usual visit here in the U.S. or whether we're in Naples or Calcutta? The ways we've still practiced health and medicine are based in old silos, old ways of thinking. And our opportunity in terms of reimagination is to break out of those silos, not thinking about health and disease by a bucket of body parts. You know, we're now in the genomics age to sort of rethink and reimagine across the spectrum. And part of that is mindset. You know, we don't really practice health care today. We practice sick care. What do I mean by sick care? Well, a sick care model is based on our very intermittent episodic data. When you go see your doctor and you get your EKG or labs, maybe you have high blood pressure and you're scribbling your blood pressure and faxing it or emailing it into your doctor or nurse whether they want to see it or not. So intermittent episodic data leads to our very reactive sick care system. We tend to wait for the patient to show up with a heart attack or a stroke or in my world of oncology, often late stage cancers. And our potential with a lot of the technologies from DARPA nets, internets, internet of things and beyond is to become much more continuous with our information information, much more proactive, personalized, and to bring care anytime, anywhere, arguably at even lower cost. And not just to think about moving the needle on disease, but to think about optimizing our, our health and wellness. Many of us want to live long, healthy lives. It's not just about years, it's, it's health span. And I come from California, a lot of people are living, interested in living forever, which is a very long time. We're seeing a whole new industry grow up around longevity, maybe even reversing the biologic clock. But bottom line, I think we really have the opportunity to change things up. While we spend the most per capita in the U.S. for healthcare, we're doing much worse than many other countries in terms of outcomes. So we really do need to reimagine health and medicine across the spectrum. So I'm going to kind of cover four big buckets quickly, and I know I'm going to talk fast. I'll give you a, a, a phone number to text at the very end to get a copy of my slides. But I want to cover where are we with health and prevention, staying healthy? Uh, how do we use new forms of data to be more engaged? What's the future of diagnosis? How do we pick up disease early rather than late? Therapy. How can it be much more personalized and less to toxic? And how can we use 
all our shared knowledge and the hive mind to all contribute to discovery. So that's a bit of arc what we're going to cover. So the future of medicine. It's a bit in the zeitgeist. This is the cover of National Geographic last year. I had the honor of writing the opening article. Um, and they kind of retitled it on me. It wasn't about 12 innovations, but it was about how all these innovations are coming together, how we can connect the dots to reshape healthcare across that healthcare paradigm. And a lot of these technologies are moving very quickly. Some of them are moving exponentially. You already heard mentioned Moore's Law, the power of computing that's embedded in our supercomputers in our pocket. And I even found recently my iPhone 2. It's actually an antique 10 years old. It still works. Ten years ago, this was amazing. Now it feels, you know, slow and clunky compared to my iPhone 11. In ten years, my iPhone 11 may be embedded in my contact lenses and feel slow. So all these technologies that most of us grew up on in this exponential age have now, you know, dissolved into apps. You don't buy a video camera or even a flashlight anymore or a map uh, or GPS. They've all become appetized and digitized. And have obviously democratized how and who can get information and access almost anywhere. And so leveraging these exponential technologies, we can really reshape things in the near term, in the next five years, in the next decade, incredible opportunity. Now, a lot of the technology that's now available through our, our magical smart devices is enabling the consumer, each of us, to have more transparency. You can compare one hospital down the street to another. There's Vitals.com, a Yelp to compare doctors, GoodRx to compare pharmacy prices. If you're about to have a total knee replacement, you can go to a surgical scorecard and look at individual surgeons and their complication rates. So new ways to gain insights and have power of consumerization. All of again, again, this is leveraging on our medicalized smartphones. These technologies have the ability to connect not just video, but new sensing. They're being integrated in surprising ways. For example, last summer published the ability to use the microphone and the speaker and a little piece of paper to look in your child's ear and determine if they have an ear infection and what kind. So on this exponential trend, what used to fit on a desktop of 2000 now fits in your Apple Watch. And your smartwatch is now becoming, you know, FDA cleared diagnostic devices to pick up things like atrial fibrillation. And of course, Beyond Moore's Law, we're moving to quantum computing, which is going to play a role in drug discovery and many other elements. So things are accelerating. And they're starting to ride, you know, 5G, 100 times the speed of 4G, connecting our internet of the body, internet of our medical things, to hopefully connect the dots in more powerful ways. Now, part of the challenge and opportunity is we're creating exponential amounts of data as well, which is often very siloed and stuck on your phone or medical records that don't talk to each other. Um, so we might be able to create new knowledge, but the challenge in this age is to, to close the gap between uh, data to knowledge to information. And there's still many misaligned incentives in making that happen. Now, technology, of course, is great, but I think most of us realize that we need to really understand the incentives uh, as well if we're going to move things forward. Because the incentives today are on the sick care side of the equation. 80% of our healthcare dollars spent on already patients who have advanced, often chronic disease, as opposed to prevention and health and wellness. And we're starting to see those shifts, particularly as we change how we pay for medicine, this idea of value-based care, paying for you know, outcomes as a new incomes. And we're lucky to have, uh, we'll hear later from the founder of Others Thinking, Michael Porter, about value-based uh, thinking as well. So how you think about technology and incentives to come together is important. But we can also sometimes incentivize, well-meaningly, the wrong things. Uh, about 20 years ago, pain was the fifth vital sign. So hospitals, doctors, healthcare systems were incentivized to Sometimes overprescribe pain medicines, and that contributed to the opioid epidemic. So be careful what you incentivize as well. Now, the incentives are clearly shifting to change where healthcare happens, from the hospital to the home to our phone to even inside our bodies, to the corner pharmacies, which are battling it out to become uh, your primary care provider, um, and sometimes even virtually. And, you know, CVS is here. Um, they're reimagining the, the clinic as a, as a uh, the, the, the pharmacy as a place to get your care in very interesting ways. Uh, Walmart as well is opening up Walmart health centers and a couple centers. Place, so we're going to see how and where care happens shift dramatically. And a lot of this is sort of being enabled by this idea of connected or mobile or digital health. Those are all buzzwords. I think we'll just soon call it health. But we have the ability to connect some of our new information and data in real time to provide new data sources that can be individualized and provide each of us and our patients and our healthcare systems to sort of appify and make sense of some of this in an integrated, mobile, and hopefully hyper-intelligent way. And it's not just about you know, digital and mobile, it's how a lot of fields are moving quickly. AI, robotics, 3D printing, nanotech, personal genomics, all converging, super converging, which enable us to address many of the challenges that we have across the planet in healthcare, from rising costs, an aging population, 
you know, access to care. Many parts of rural California, rural uh, Florida don't have enough specialists or nurses. So no matter what happens to Obamacare or Trump care, which is really no care or Putin care, depending on your politics, you know, we have a challenge of getting care and access to folks who need them. We have lots of data, but it's often siloed. It isn't actionable. And we also have a challenge with our regulatory bodies, the F word, the FDA. How do they think exponentially? And our payers, who have the hammer on paying for new innovations as well. So lots of grand challenges, but lots of opportunity. And a lot of that is not about high tech. I mean, most of our outcomes are really based on our social determinants. Our genetic code is, are, is less important than our zip code in terms of health outcomes. We just heard an amazing talk about the, you know, the importance of water and clean water and globalizing that. That's part of our key social determinants. Uh, vaccination, healthy food. So we need to pay attention uh, to those uh, you know, key elements of Maslow's hierarchy. Of course, we have some new base elements today in our technological world that really drive us. Most importantly, of course, if someone can cure battery life, that's our, our most important need. So, all right. So, reimagination is coming. I come from Silicon Valley, where we think we're the home of, of innovation. Um, you know, and think about companies like Uber. They're only 10, 11 years old. They didn't, they're exponential companies. They didn't invent the smartphone, GPS, online maps, online payments. They, they connected the dots to solve transportation. And, of course, everyone wants to Uberize everything. Here's a fun one from Japan. A human Uber, developed in Japan, provides a way to attend events remotely using another person's body. It's surprisingly natural, says this vendor. So next time you can come to this conference, send your human Uber. And then even Uber themselves is getting into healthcare to uh, bring vaccines to folks who have difficulty getting to the clinic or the pharmacy. Uh, we're seeing the Uberization of drug delivery uh, and pressing a button, a doctor and nurse coming to your home. So all these things are coming together in interesting ways. The big players, Google, Amazon, Facebook, all getting into healthcare, getting into the pharmacy space. Soon you'll have your dr drugs literally um, delivered by, uh, by drone. Uh, and so Amazon Health Prime, I think, is on its way. And in fact, um, just last week, the first Amazon Care Clinic opened up in Seattle for its employees. So lots of shifts and new players coming into the space. So disruptive change is coming. Our friends at Pharma, Pharmageddon. It will no, no longer be one-size-fits-all pills. We're seeing the change of how we interact with our payer, right? Make it more inter interesting and engaging for your health information. Many fields, and many of you have been involved in building some incredible companies and technologies have changed the world. And no one wants to be the next Kodak or Blockbuster. You know, Kodak actually invented digital photography, but didn't pay attention to the exponential rise in, in digital photography, and, and they went bust. So you want to be the disruptor, not the disruptee. You basically want to be Ubering yourself before you get Kodak, as a summary. Okay, so, and sometimes technologies aren't quite where they are yet, but don't, don't realize that. I was in, in Dubai Airport. I saw this self-tracking um, suitcase. It actually bumped into a few things, a little kludgy. Uh, so things don't, just because they don't feel perfect doesn't mean one or two more clicks in Moore's Law might mean they're not magical. So uh, don't be despaired by the not perfect technology. So how am I as a physician scientist talking to you about the future of healthcare? Well, since it started 10, 11 years ago, I've been the chair of medicine at something called Singularity University, co-founded by Ray Kurzweil and Peter Diamandis. And we look at how to understand exponential technologies to aggress grand challenges, including those in healthcare. And because healthcare is such a team sport, but often so siloed, I started a program 10 years ago called Exponential Medicine, and we meet every fall. Uh, and Randy came to it last November, where we bring folks from 44 countries together, and we look at what's the convergence of these technologies? How do we cross-fertilize and share lessons? And sometimes the lesson is not about anything new, but how do we get out of our old mindsets? The difficulty lies not in the new ideas, but in escaping from the old ones. So lots of opportunity to change, even bringing the FDA to understand software as a medical device and accelerate pathways there. So hopefully some of you might want to join us this fall uh, at Exponential Medicine. Okay, let's look at these areas quickly. Let's start with health and prevention. How do we stay healthy? You know, our genes are important, but it's our behaviors, particularly our behaviors over many years that drive most of our healthcare costs. And it's only been about 10, 11 years since we're able to start to measure our behaviors. Fitbit only launched in late 2009. How many of you are wearing some sort of wearable tracker right now, right? About a third of you, I'm wearing like five versions right now. Uh, you know, and these are becoming ubiquitous and more and more powerful. Um, they can be used in simple ways. Someone who might have had a, a hip surgery or knee surgery, when they go home, you can see are they walking more or walking less. Simple, small data. And we're moving from an era of quantified self, where that data lives on your phone, to quantified health, where it starts to connect to your healthcare system for optimizing your wellness, to do early diagnostics, and to manage disease. So you all know the uh, scale. Now we're seeing the shape scale. Whether you want to or not, you can not just get your weight, but your shape, how much your muscle mass is, how much your uh, fat mass is. That might be part of your medical record, so quantifying that. Blood pressure can now be done on a watch band, and we're seeing new ways to do that with cuffless radar-based ones. This one was just FDA approved, so we'll see the ability to 
measure hypertension uh, 24-7 uh, in really interesting ways. Um, so new, new forms of collecting data anytime, anywhere. And we're going beyond wearables, the idea that there's insideables, contact lenses that can have sensors in them, all the way to chips underneath your skin that will start censoring 24-7 uh, you know, data. It, it starts, of course, with the military and the, and the DARPA world for soldiers, but we'll start managing patients with chronic disease with subcutaneous skin sensors. We can go to the idea of trainables, right? It's, good, it's one thing to get information, but what if we, in our smartphone era, and we all have a smartphone neck, we can have our own digital mother, a little sensor you put on your back, and it uh, senses your, your posture. And uh, basically, if I can get my clicker to work here, um, it basically will sense your posture, and if you're hunched over for too long, it'll give you a little nudge. So it's the idea of a little feedback loop uh, that can give you a, a, a tingle and retrain your physiology, so uh, trainables. Shockables, you might need some more impetus. Hearables, hearing aids, and other elements that can d um, detect vital signs. Ringables, that can track your sleep. Sleep is such, a, such an important part of health, and we can measure that in new ways and maybe even modulate that in workplaces. So if nothing else, pay attention to your sleep data. Breathables, the idea that now we can breathe into small devices and uh, not just check the quality of your breath before you're going on a social engagement, but the molecules that might be early signs of, let's say, lung cancer or other challenges. Sockables to detect problems in the feet of diabetics. Underwearables, my favorite. I won't, I won't show you the one I'm wearing, but these sensors have gotten so small and cheap now, and now that we're getting paid for remote patient monitoring, you can have this little sensor that tracks your breath and your heart rate, and physicians and healthcare systems can be paid for finding signs of bronchitis or COPD or problems that would put someone back in a hospital or I'm wearing a belt I got in South Korea that doesn't just track my steps, but my likelihood of maybe having a fall, and maybe the next generation uh, might be a protectable. Uh, if someone has a risk of fall, maybe, maybe they wanna wear something like this. A bit, bit too far on the spectrum, but you get the idea. So there's a wearable now for almost everything. Um, and we can start to quantify almost everything, our food, right? We can start to measure peanut allergies, uh, peanuts, calories. I've got a device that will let you sort of hack your metabolism. It tells you, are you in ketogenic state or burning uh, carbohydrates? You can measure input, you can measure output. Lots of data there. Um, Regina mentioned diets, right? Diets are becoming more personalized. Food is medicine. Hippocrates said, food, food be thy medicine. We can now start to integrate our microbiome, our genome, and other information to really truly personalize our diets to, to match you, not just everybody else. And beyond wearables, we're now this idea of insideables. You know, our cameras now can pick up vital signs of a, a child in a crib or your, or your own blood pressure and heart rate just from the, from the camera on your, on your smartphone. So really interesting new abilities to collect this data anytime, anywhere. Uh, if you're thinking about aging in place, the idea that your camera, you know, there's privacy issues here, but of course now cameras with AI can pick up uh, behaviors. Is someone up and drinking? Uh, uh, are they dressed? That could be useful for, for keeping folks out of nursing facilities. And even our voice can be used to pick up signs of cardiac disease. Or Wi-Fi has been modified by MIT engineers to pick up the vital signs of 10 or more people in the same room. So we're really entering an era where we're going to be able to pick up our vitals, our digital exhaust, our digitome 24-7. What are the implications of that, both good and bad? I mean, some insurance companies now are paying people or lowering premiums if you're hitting your 10,000 steps. So you are many entrepreneurs here. If you're thinking about new business opportunities, you know, people pay me to put steps on the Fitbits. There'll be an opportunity there for sure. So all this big data, right? It's already overwhelming. What is it, Doc? Just as I thought you're generating too much data, your physician does not want more data about you. They're already being burnt out by a horrible medical record system. They need to integrate this into their workflow so it's smart and uh, seamless and not adding burdens. Uh, we need to understand what this digital exhaust means. Google or Verily is now doing the baseline project, looking at the, the digital exhaust and data from thousands of volunteers so we can make sense of that. So we can sort of build like a FICO score for your health that integrates individual information from multiple sources. And just like your modern car has a check engine light, imagine you have your own personalized check engine light that can make sense of your own data and integrate that over time. And maybe your wearables will start to pick up the flu or coronavirus remotely. I had a, had a cold a couple weeks ago. I could see my resting heart rate go up, for example. So lots of new examples of how everything from our Apple Watch and the sensors in our homes will start to give us proactive early warning. Now, it's great to have all this data, but we know behavior change is hard. We know we should exercise more and eat less. Sometimes we need coaches, virtual coaches, AI coaches. Google's building a coaching platform. Um, as you become more engaged in your own health in this information and it can work with virtual world coaches, you can be much more empowered. And that's not one size fits all. We need design thinking, you know? How a baby boomer interacts with health information versus a millennial is very, very different. Um, so we need to design these to match the individual, the age, and the culture. And sometimes that means some of us will be comfortable talking to an AI avatar. That feels very, very real. It could look like Einstein or your mother. It depends who you might respond to. 
Voice is becoming an important platform. You know, talking to Alexa. Alexa, remind me of my medication. Alexa, help, I fall and I can't get back up. Lots of apps being built on voice. You don't need to be a tech savvy consumer to interact with that kind of technology. It's coming into listening to our doctor visits and writing the notes for the clinicians. And so we'll enter an era where we're able to have our coach in the mirror in the morning and might give us, show us you of today or you of tomorrow if you smoke or if you spend too much time on social media. So new ways of blending information to empower change. And of course, we're going to start augmenting our environment. You know, I've got my 10-year-old Google Glass here. I'm sorry, six-year-old. These were pretty amazing six years ago. And they haven't been a great consumer hit, but have tons of applications now for the surgeon or the doctor to pull information and see augmented medical information. Or if you're having a surgery, to have your own biology or anatomy uh, shown to the clinician to uh, enable a faster, better procedure. Or for kids to learn about their, their own anatomy using augmented reality. Here's my... My son, Leo, he knows his anatomy at age three from wearing this sort of AR shirt. So we're going to see all sorts of new ways to blend this information into our environment with things like Magic Leap or from the world of aviation. I'm a pilot, a flight surgeon in the Air National Guard. We use uh, technologies like the heads-up display to give you data. If you're flying, you're in a combat, you're about to hit a mountain, the plane will talk to you. <laughs> Oh, ah. oh, that will wake you up. Uh, so imagine, sorry about that, if we applied that technology to your health, you might see your breakfast in one way and with your augmented reality, see it in another way and then give you a little nudge, right? Cool. Ah. Yeah, so uh, all those things are coming together. Speaking of flying, I'm really excited to see my friend Richard Browning, who's going to show his jet suit off. I got to actually, as a pilot, uh, try that out a few months ago. It's a little harder than it works, looks. I, I, did a, I was able to get off the ground there a little bit tethered. So you can see uh, it's, it's not impossible to do that sort of thing. It's pretty amazing, but I also could show you uh, how not to do it as well. Uh, here's my sort of James Bond impersonation, uh, uh, and we'll get to see Richard next. So uh, don't try this at home quite yet. Um, what about virtual reality? How many of you have tried virtual reality? It's uh, really amazing to ride your first roller coaster. It feels real. Um, but uh, VR is now being used for getting in shape or uh, for folks with pain to go in cold environments and throw snowballs for therapy or for physical therapy to make it much more engaging and much more fun. Or if you're in a hospital or stuck in a procedure room, you could be literally at the beach so it can lower stress levels. So we're seeing VR and AR play a pretty amazing role. And surgeons now are yet leveraging that to train for procedures instead of practicing on you. They can, like, a, like an airline pilot, go into a flight simulator and basically practice and simulate. So instead of see one, do one, teach one, it's see one, sim one, sim one. We're going to sort of build these maps to enable clinicians of the future, like driver assist to physician assist. And the robots will take over more and more of that uh, moving forward. So uh, it's going to be interesting blend moving. Okay. Let's uh, switch gears to diagnostics really quickly. Lots is happening in terms of where and how we can do diagnostics. Um, we can now look at our brains in interesting ways. Uh, folks who might be at risk of dementia, we might pick up signs of uh, early dementia 10 or 20 years before normal symptoms and maybe apply uh, new drugs that can be re reverse and stop disease like a statin for the brain uh, moving forward. I've had my brain, brain scanned. We can understand our physiology and then again, uh, be much more proactive if we can get this sort of information. And these scanners are getting smaller and cheaper. Uh, and this is a more portable one that was just FDA approved. And it, you may be going to your corner pharmacy in the next day can get, and getting scanned. Your clinician or you can be much more empowered to have your own sort of digital diagnostic tools from telemedicine platforms. So you're just talking to a clinician, but you can also uh, have them look at your ears and nose and listen to your heart. There's now uh, stethoscopes that are built that have uh, AI built into them. So they can upskill anyone to be as good at listening to heart sounds as a highly trained cardiologist. Uh, we're seeing AI powered ultrasounds for $2,000 that can now bring and democratize diagnostics almost anywhere, anytime. So the blend of these technologies applied in the right way can can really apply to global health and bring uh, better care uh, anytime, anywhere. My clicker is really, technology is not working here on the clicker side. Maybe the battery is low, okay. Then of course, you can do diagnostics on your smartphone, picking up atrial fibrillation and communicating that to your clinician. And we're just in the beginning days of that. There are now FDA patches that you can wear that will stream your entire intensive care unit level of vital signs 24-7 or laboratories on a chip that can replace what require, you know, a team of laboratory can be done on a smartphone or even using your camera as a diagnostic. This is my favorite, you know, smartphone selfie. You might have signs of a urinary tract infection. You simply dip the urine in the dipstick uh, and take a picture with your smartphone camera and the urinalysis is done right away. So we have sort of real-time information uh, and your uh, antibiotic is delivered by drone. So tons of potential there. And then there's genomics and other information. I'm running low on time, so I'm going to skip forward a little bit here. I apologize. Real-time. Um, 
to, to where we are with therapy. There's a lot of interesting therapies coming down the pike, and I'm just going to cover a couple of them quickly in the last minute or so. Um, everything from you know, gene editing, which has really moved from discovery 10, or 10 years ago or less to now to actually curing diseases like sickle cell disease. We're in the era of now of virtualized medicine, telemedicine, so you won't go to see your doctor before you talk to the app in some cases. These apps are changing how and where we'll do asynchronous care. In China, there's 250 million patients now using these mobile apps to get their care, folks who didn't have almost any access to care. We'll be doing increasing telehealth and tele, uh, teleradiology. Digiceuticals prescribing you an app instead of uh, just a drug. And there's so many of these technologies. I've just launched a website called digital.health where you can find, and your clinicians can find the technologies that match you. So check out digital.health. Um, finally, I'll give one last example, is 3D printing, another technology that's moving quickly. We might be able to 3D print an organ in the future. I think that's going to be a bit unnecessary because we can now take our gene editing, our CRISPR, and humanize a pig. And you may not really want to be stating on the waiting list for an organ. It may not be kosher, but you will take that humanized xenograft organ from the pig. And that's moving into clinical trials pretty soon. The last example I'll give is, the, uh, many of us are familiar with the idea of polypharmacy. We have a whole pile of medications to take. We're cutting them half of the pill cutter. We're using this advanced technology to track them. So I've been developing a technology to personalize your drugs, to pick the right drugs that, that match you. So you could literally 3D print a medicine with your name on it, with your drugs and doses that match what you might need. And eventually, you might even print that medication in your home every day, every day based on your data. So that's a, a new platform called IntelliMedicine. You can see my last TED Talk for more on that. But the idea is that you'll be able to take your data, modify, uh, and print, and take that going forward. So new ways to integrate all this exponential data to really provide personalized precision medicine. And finally, in the last minute, all this new technology needs new forms to bring it together. Artificial intelligence, AI, or IA, intelligence augmentation, is going to help us do new discoveries, discovering new drugs, helping each of us and our clinicians make sense of this data. We can all now contribute to clinical trials, uh, integrating what used to take going to a clinic to something you can wear on your wrist or, or, mo or mobilize for your phone. You can all download a clinical trial today and become be part of that. And so I think part of the future of health and medicine is going to be shifting our world just as much as Google Maps and Waze have changed how we drive. We all donate some data, our speed and location. We build a, a map of our traffic. What if we could all contribute to a healthcare map around the planet and think of ourselves not just as organ and blood donors, but as data donors going forward. And while we want to keep our information private and secure, we should have the optimization and right to share our data. It might be from our social network. It might be how we're feeling today. And in the era of pandemics, uh, you may give us a clue before you meet somebody uh, based on all that synthesis about, uh, I think Randy's okay, uh, about who and where we should meet. So the future of medicine, I think, is bright if we think exponentially, if we think convergently. How do we put these technologies together in new ways? We want to imagine and reimagine new solutions, not just with the technologies of 2020, to but to skate to where the puck is going to be, like Wayne Gretzky says, and the puck is moving faster and faster. So I encourage all of us to not just take you know, linear steps, but start to take exponential ones. The future's already here. It's just not evenly distributed. It's partly in my pockets. And we all have the opportunity not to just predict the future, but boldly create the future of healthcare together. So with that, thank you for your time and attention, and go create the future. Cheers. Thank you, Daniel. Fantastic. Thanks. Really appreciate it. Thanks.